then today we're going to start talking about the critique of the views that we've talked about that is launched by Bishop George Barclay and David Hume. Their attack is really one that tends in the direction of idealism. Barclay very explicitly, Hume I think a little bit less explicitly, but gives you an argument for thinking that all of the objects we can know anything about are mind de dependent, and also that they have a character that's really quite different from the one that common sense takes them to have. Now, George Barclay himself was Irish, he was a bishop of the church, and he was actually trying to defend common sense. Now, when we look at his view, you're going to think, man, that doesn't seem very commonsensical at all. But he's worried about the arguments of the skeptics. He's concerned that the skeptics are going to succeed in showing that we cannot know anything about the world, that we cannot know the things in themselves. And his goal is to retreat and say, well, as Augustine said, I can know how things appear to me. But maybe the objects that we ordinarily talk about, people, tables, and chairs, and so on, really are just the appearances. Maybe they are just constructions out of the things that we perceive. And if that's right, then we can know about them. And knowing how things look to us is just knowing the world. There is no content to the idea that there is a real world out there independent of us that is separate from the things that appear to us and the way they appear to us. So Barclay argues that the concept of object that you find in Descartes, that you find in Locke, that you find really throughout most of the Western philosophical tradition, from Plato and Aristotle all the way up through those early modern philosophers, doesn't make any sense. He's going to say the whole idea of material substance is nonsense. The idea of a primary quality that exists in objects themselves and is not merely a power to affect us in a certain way, that that's unintelligible too. In fact, they aren't going to like this concept of a power to affect us very much at all, they're really going to just say an object is a bundle of perceptions. It's a bundle of qualities. It's a bundle of things that are actually related to ideas that are perceptions that are, in some sense, mental constructions. So we're going to see an attack on the notion of a primary quality, an attack on the notion of substance. Well, to take you back a little bit, here is the distinction we talked about between primary and secondary qualities. You wrote about it in paper two, so you must by now understand it very, very well. Anyway, here's the idea. The primary qualities of a thing are in the thing itself. They are properties that belong to even its most minute parts. And so things like mass, length, velocity, uh, acceleration, trajectory, those things are traditionally taken to be primary qualities of a thing. The table really does have a certain mass, and that is a quality of the table itself. Similarly, it has a certain size, and that is a quality of the table itself. A secondary quality, on the other hand, like the table's uh, texture, for example, or its color, that's something that is a power to affect us, says Locke, says Descartes. It doesn't exist in the minor parts. So the electrons, the protons, the molecules that make up this table are things that do have a velocity, they do have a mass, um, they do have a size, and so forth, but they don't have a color. They don't have a texture. They don't have these various other secondary qualities. Yeah? What do you mean by texture? Because if something is more slippery, more glossy than something else, that's a primary quality. Well, here I mean how it feels. So it's like, uh, the, the surface of this actually feels pretty rough. Uh, this, this could stand to be sanded down and refinished. <laughs> <laughs> it carefully. But if you're it's marked up. If you're physically affecting it to make it feel less, then it would be a primary quality. I don't see how a texture... I, I think he means, like, oh. how you interpret it as feeling. Like, yeah. this feels rough. Like, it, it can have, like, its own, like, texture, but how it feels to you is the secondary quality. Right. The secondary quality is sort of how it feels to me. It feels rough. It feels smooth. It's like how it affects your senses. It's how it affects my senses. Okay. Right. Okay. But now you're making a really important point, which is that these secondary qualities, according to Descartes' law, depend on the primary quality. In other words, it feels a certain way because the shape of the table really is a certain way. And similarly, it has a certain color, or here, complicated combination of colors, because of the wavelengths of light, light that are being reflected, and that is a primary quality of the table. So I don't see wavelengths of light, but I do see colors that are the effects of those. And similarly, I don't really see the mathematical um, sort of shape, you might say, of the table in detail but that's what's responsible for my feeling in a certain way. Now, when you think about it in that way, you realize 
gosh, the space is open for somebody to say, well, actually, I think the secondary quality just is that underlying primary quality. The texture really is that underlying shape of the surface. And similarly, the color really is just a tendency to reflect certain wavelengths of light. Um, but that's not the view of Descartes and Locke. They're drawing a distinction there between the actual shape of the thing, the actual uh, primary characteristic of it, and then the way it affects my senses. Now, here is Barclay's idea. This requires us to draw a distinction between the way things appear to us and the way they really are underlying those perceptions. And Barclay says, wait a minute, I don't know how I'm supposed to draw that distinction. I have access to my own perceptions of the thing, but I have no access to the way that it looks or that it is independent of how it appears to any of us. So the idea is really, aha, I've got my appearance over here, and then I've got the thing in itself. And in some way, I can judge what is a quality over here and what's a quality over here. But Barclay says, that's ridiculous. All I have access to are my own perceptions, my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own ideas. And so I can't get past those and jump out of my mind to see how well my mind is matching up to reality. Now, it's easy to draw a picture there where it's like, ah, here's my mind. Well, let me actually use this for a second. Here's my mind. It's like this thought bubble over my body, let's say. <laughs> and here's the world as it actually is. There, that's North and South America. <laughs> and, you know, I can think, oh, yeah, but now how can I see it? All I've got, really, are my own perceptions over here, my own ideas. There's no way for me to get outside and be somewhere up here as if I could say, aha, I'm looking at my own mind, and I'm looking at the world, and now I'm judging what's where. Um, I can't do that. It's impossible. And so, because I can't really arise out of my own head in that way, I'm stuck with the way things merely appear to me. Now, he has another argument besides just the fact that I only have access to my perceptions, to the way things appear to me. I don't have access to the things in themselves, and so I can't judge or compare those things. He also says the idea that is often put forward to draw the distinction between primary and secondary qualities is that the primary qualities, being in the thing itself, don't change, whereas the secondary qualities change. And here would be an example. Uh, we've got, let's say, some water here, and it's at a certain temperature. Now, I ask you to put your hand first in a much colder bucket of water, and then put it over here. That's going to feel warm. But then I have someone else put their hand in something that is hotter, and then they put it in this, it's going to feel cool. So the same thing can feel cooler or warmer, depending upon all sorts of factors. Actually, I don't know if you've noticed this, but swimming in the same water that is the same temperature feels warmer during the day than it does at night. And in both cases, the water you're swimming in might be the same temperature. It might be 80 degrees, let's say. But 80 degrees will feel warm in the heat of the afternoon, even though you're underwater, right? It's not a question of the air affecting you. And it will feel cool in the evening, even though it's really exactly the same temperature. And that's the same sort of phenomenon. So he says, here, look, our perceptions of things like temperature, of height, of width, change while the objects remain unchanged. And that, he thinks, is a suggestion that even those things called primary qualities are really secondary. In the dialogues concerning <laughs> these issues, he has Falona say this. But from what you've laid down, it follows that both the extension by you perceived and that perceived by the might itself is likewise always perceived by lesser animals, or each of them the true extension of the might's foot. That is to say, by your own principles, you're led into an absurdity. Now, what does he mean here? Well, this is a might's view of carpeting. It's kind of troubling. Look down at the carpet and then think, how would that look if you were a little dust mite? The answer is it would look like that, you and your fellow mites nibbling away. It's, by the way, creepy. That's really going on <coughs> right now beneath your feet. Uh, there is a book, in fact, called The, sort of the Unseen House, I think, uh, that talks about the things that go on when you're not home. The dust mites. It's extremely creepy. I don't recommend I mean, it's actually awesome, but it's really kind of creepy. Anyhow, yes, or that. 
is how human skin appears from the point of view of a mite. Anyway, oh, that person badly needs a shower. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. But anyway, that suggests, look, this looks huge, right, to a mite. Um, just that's up like one pore. Well, a pore looks tiny to me, and yet it might look huge, cavernous to a dust mite. That's very weird. So is it large or is it small? <laughs> now, Philonus continues, but as we approach to or recede from an object, the visible extension varies, being at one distance 10 or 100 times greater than another. Doth it not therefore follow from hence likewise that it is not really inherent in the object? So, for example, yes, well, look at my car keys. They might look very small from the back of the room. But up to close, they, you know, and now if I go like this, like, whoa, it takes up my entire visual field. Look at those huge Volkswagen keys. <laughs> so the appearance, uh, how big it looks, well, that depends how close it is to my eye. Here's a, a different example. That is a mountain in northwestern New Mexico, Shiprock. Now, here it is seen at quite a distance. Um, it was a way that wagon trains going to, to the west coast used to actually sort of steer by uh, because it's perceptible from such a great distance. Well, from this distance, you can see the mountain, but it looks pretty small, right? It's like, wow, I feel off the distance. As you approach, it looks bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, well, so what? <laughs> so Barclay says, the size of it isn't really a primary quality of it. It changes with the perceiver, much as your perception of the temperature does, much as your perception of color does, and so on. Yes? Yeah. Another question. I don't okay. think he talks about this, but obviously this is like parallax, where it looks. But we can use our secondary quality to find out the true size of something. Like if we want to find out the distance of stars, we can use parallax. Right. So I guess that would still be a secondary quality, but you can use it to find the primary quality. Well, okay. Um, yeah. The reason I'm smiling strangely is that. I think Barclay's argument here is nonsense, to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay, I'm giving you the argument, but you're raising a question in a sense I can't answer because I think it's a really good question. I mean, look, uh, yes, admittedly, when I'm approaching from a distance, I don't really know how big Shiprock is because I don't know how far away that is. And so I can't do the kind of computation I would do involving a parallax of the stars or here, trying to figure out just how far away that mountain is or how large it is. Um, however, if I move around, then maybe I can. And in other ways, you know, look, all I have to do is approach it. Yes, it looks like, it looks bigger and bigger, but it's bizarre to say, shiprock, I mean, the size of it, it changes, right? When you're, when you're viewing it from, oh, I don't know, what, where can you, what's the closest point you can see it from? I uh, can't quite see it from Santa Fe, because you don't have to go too far west of Santa Fe. Anyway, uh, wherever that is, you look and you might say, ooh, it's small. But then you know what? It's like this magical mountain because shiprock grows as you approach it. You get, I mean, it just gets bigger and bigger, right? You walk toward it, it's like the mountain just comes right out of the ground. And then as you go away, it sings back slowly. Well, that's absurd, right? Of course it doesn't do that. And so, in fact, once you sort of understand the principles, in this case, you wouldn't need more than trigonometry to say, okay, here's how far I am from Shiprock, here is how big it appears to me, and so here's how big it must really be. And in that respect, I find this argument not very persuasive at all. So if you're in effect saying, well, look, but this Barclay's argument here doesn't make any sense. In the end, I can't agree with you. <laughs> okay, I think it's a better argument to worry about whether I can get outside my own head enough to know how my ideas altogether match up to some reality that is underlying those perceptions altogether. But the fact that the keys look bigger as I bring them toward my eye doesn't impress me at all. I'm not in the slightest tempted to say, look, my magical Volkswagen keys get bigger as they approach my head. <laughs> and then they shrink as they go away. Of course they don't do that. Uh, yeah? Uh, well, how would like weight and mass play this? Because, so if you go to the moon, your mass stays the same, but your weight and your feel lighter. Good, so mass and weight would be a similar kind of thing, where the weight is the secondary quality, let's say, and the mass is the primary quality. And if you think, but wait, how, I mean, you don't even have to go to the moon. 
Just go to the gym and lift weights. And on the last rep, whatever it is, feels a lot heavier than it does on the first <laughs> rep. Right? So, uh, yeah. Um, that's something that the perception changes. And in fact, it changes day to day. I, some days I feel very strong. I remember one day in the gym, I have no idea why I was strong that day. But I walked in and I did 18 reps of the bench press at 225. Then I did eight at 245. And then I did another 16 at 225. And it all felt easy. And I sort of thought, man, this is awesome. I am now so strong. <laughs> and then the next time I went into the gym, I just tried my warm-up set of 225. And okay, I could do that, but I couldn't do 18 reps of that. And it felt very heavy. It was kind of like, why that one day was I magically strong? I mean, what happened that day? I don't know, but those weights felt like that. And I don't think it was really a difference in the weights. It wasn't like somebody snuck in and said, let's, let's just label these 45 pound weights, even though they're really just cardboard or something. <laughs> Maybe somebody tricked me, but I think, no, it's the same math. But the perception of that was really different. But it doesn't convince me that actually the mass of something is a secondary quality. I think part of it had to do with the fact that the move was on the stereo at the gym that day. And I, that's an old album I haven't heard in years, and I was thrilled by that. And so it was like, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, a band called The Move, look it up. It's like, they're awesome. It will make you stronger just listening to them. I guarantee you. Okay. Well, anyway, back to the point. I think, <laughs> yes, the same thing is going to arise with respect to um, color, with respect to weight, with respect to sound. Something, I mean, here's a good indicator of that. You might be at a concert, let's say, and you get used to the loud level of sound. Um, and it no longer sounds all that loud to you. But if you go out and then come back in, all of a sudden it sounds very loud, right? Your perception of that is dependent on the context and what you've got your ear used to. And the same thing is true, actually, of higher and lower pitches. Something will sound like it's a very high-pitched thing if the singer, let's say, has been singing lower notes, even if it's really not that high a note. Um, on some songs, you can hear something, and it's really just like, I don't know, a D above, well, the C above middle C. <laughs> Uh, and it will sound very high in the context of that song, but then put it in the middle of something where that same soprano is going up to the D above that, and that won't sound like a high sound at all. So a lot of this depends on the context. Now, what exactly we should infer from that, I'm not sure. But here's what Barclay infers from that, that these <coughs> properties really are not in the objects themselves. Valona says, isn't it the very same reason to conclude that there is no extension or figure in an object? Because to one eye, it would seem little, smooth, and round, but at the same time, it appears to the other great, uneven, and regular. Um, Ida says, well, the very same, but does this latter fact ever happen? Well, you may at any time make the experiment by looking with one eye bare and the other eye through a microscope. So here's another example. This is what a jasmine leaf looks at, looks like with the naked eye. And here it is under a microscope. It looks really different. And so you might think, oh, wow, well, the primary qualities <laughs> that it appears that here, gosh, it appears very different over there. Or so, Philonus argues. <laughs> He's not impressed with that one either. All right. Now, here's a different kind of argument against the notion of substance. We've so far been talking about the attack on primary qualities. But there is a more generalized attack on the notion of substance. And I at least think it's a much more serious challenge. Locke treats substance as the basis of properties. Okay? But when he's thinking about this, he's actually inspired, I think, by a metaphysics book, Zayn, from Aristotle. He's thinking about the notion of substance. And he's thinking of substance as the kind of thing that holds the properties together. I, for example, am a person. I am speaking right now. I am musical. I am a philosopher. I, am, I have hands. All these things are true of me, and all of those properties in some way are held together by my substance. But if you ask what that substance is, what the thing is that holds all of those properties together, Aristotle would have said, well, a human being. But Locke says something I know not what. I ask, well, what is it that is speaking? Oh, a man. 
what is it that is a man? Um, gosh, I don't know. What, maybe a physical being or something like that. Um, what is it that is that physical being? Mm, something. I know not what. Now, Barclay says, look, well, that idea has no content at all. We experience only qualities. We don't experience anything underlying them that holds them all together. I, for example, look at each one of you and I see your face. I see other parts of your bodies. I see your clothing. But I don't see the thing that has the face, the thing that is wearing the clothing, the, the thing that has that body, and so on. Um, all of those are, you might say, characteristics of a certain substance. But I have no direct perception of the substance. I only see the qualities. I only see the properties, really, um, not the underlying thing. Here is what Locke says about substance. And this is the passage that inspires Berkeley's critique. If anyone will examine himself concerning his notion of pure substance in general, he will find he has no other idea of it at all, but only a supposition of he knows not what support of such qualities which are capable of producing simple ideas in us, which qualities are commonly called accidents. If anyone should be asked, what is the subject wherein color or weight inheres, he would have nothing to say but the solid extended parts. And if it were demanded, what is, what is it that solidity and extension adhere to? He would not be in much better case than the Indian before mentioned, who saying that the world was supported by a great elephant, was asked what the elephant rested on, to which his answer was a great tortoise. But being again pressed to know what gave support to the broad-backed tortoise, he replied, something he knew not what. So there's a little diagram of the world resting on the back of the elephant, and then on the back of the tortoise. There's another one. Another one. As you can see, this has inspired lots of art. <laughs> but now it's embarrassing, right, to say in the end, well, what supports all the qualities is something I know not what. Barclay is, in effect, saying the moment you get to the point where you say, eh, something I know not what, just give it up. It's doing no work for you. It's not explaining anything in your theory. It's not accomplishing anything. It's an idea that actually has no empirical content. So what will we say, then, of your external object? Is it a material substance or no? Heidel says it's a material substance with the sensible qualities adhering in it. He's trying to defend that Descartes law position. And then Philonus, who is representing Barclay here, says, how then can a great heat exist in it since you own it? It cannot be a material substance. So if once we say, yeah, the qualities adhere in a material substance, and then we say, well, what is it that is this material substance? Being a material substance is a quality of what exactly? We have no idea what to say. So he continues. Though the colors are really in the tulip which I see is manifest, neither can it be denied that this tulip may exist independent of your mind or my mind, but that any immediate object of the senses, that is, any idea or combination of ideas, should exist in an unthinking substance or exterior to all minds is in itself an evident contradiction. So he's basically saying this, the red of the tulip, that's an idea, that's a perception in your mind, so it's absurd to say the red is in the tulip, the red is in your mind. <laughs> But then you say, well, what is it that is in the tulip? The primary qualities, Locke would say. But wait a minute. If the primary qualities are also things that really are ideas in my mind, then, ah, we don't know what to say about what primary qualities in theory. He says, nor can I imagine how this follows from what you said just now, that the red and the yellow were on the tulip you saw, since you don't pretend to see an unthinking substance. So the red, the yellow, those are ideas in the mind. Those are perceptions. But if that's true, they can't be in the tulip. And so, because after all, the tulip doesn't think. It's not a mind. It can't contain an idea. So he says, every corporeal substance, being the substratum of extension, must have itself another extension, by which it's qualified to be a substratum, and so on to infinity. This is absurd in itself and repugnant to what you granted just now. So, in effect, he's saying, look, on your view, the answer really had better be turtles all the way down. <laughs> to go back to Locke's metaphor, the world rests on the back of a great elephant, it rests on the back of a great tortoise. Well, now if things have to rest on other things, doesn't that mean we need another tortoise for it to stand on, and so on, infinitely? It would have to be tortoises all the way down. And in the end, we never come to something that could serve as a support for the qualities we perceive. There's a pile of tortoises. <laughs> Okay, so what then is Barclay's view of what objects are? They're just bundles of qualities. They aren't qualities stuck in something I know not what. They are just bundles of qualities together. 
what Aristotle called substances, these things, objects, are really just collections of properties. There's not anything that we experience that binds them together. So somehow they're bundled together, but we don't perceive the bundling, we don't perceive the string tying them together. These just are qualities that come together. You hear my voice and you see me, and these qualities are just there together. But if you say, why are they there together? Locke will say, well, they both adhere in something, I know not what. Aristotle would say they're both properties of a human being, that's the what. But once you take a step beyond that and say, what is it that is a human being that has the qualities of a human being? Then you're led in this chase for this underlying support. And so Barclay says, just give that up. Just talk about the qualities being held together somehow. They're just together. That's all you can say. David Hume takes that even one step further. They are just held together. And what's doing the bundling is our own mental activity. The bundles aren't bundled out there in the world. We are doing the bundling. We're the ones who are tying it up with our mental string, as it were. The bundle isn't held together out in the world, it's held together in our minds. So yes, objects are just these bundles of quality, but qualities, but they don't come already bundled. We're doing the bundling. We're the ones who are actually taking these qualities and dividing them up into objects for our own convenience, for our own purposes. Well, here is Barclay's conclusion from all this, and this is where the idealism becomes explicit. He says, in the end, to be is simply to be perceived. Esse es percipit is the Latin for this. <laughs> for unthinking things, he's now meaning to exclude us and God. To exist is to be perceived. So they couldn't possibly exist out of the minds or thinking things that perceive. Here's the basic argument. We have access only to what is before the mind. But everything before the mind is really just an idea of some form. And a thing can exist only if it's perceived, so a thing can exist only if it's before the mind. So everything that exists is really dependent on the mind. To be is just to be perceived by a mind. Well, do things go out of existence then when we stop looking at them? For example, there are people leaving the room. We can't see them anymore. Do they still exist? See, that's why I never worry about people leaving class early, because I figure they just go out of existence. <laughs> you know, things just pop into existence, they just pop out of existence. Kind of like cats on my doorstep, they just show up, then they leave. <laughs> Actually, they never leave, that's why I have so many cats. Um, but you might say, yeah, now, did those people, when we stop perceiving them, cease to exist? Did they just walk up out of here and go, Poof. she goes. <laughs> No. Why? Because God's still perceiving them. That's Barclay's answer. So you might think, ooh, can I make the room disappear? <laughs> you ruined it. I could hear you laughing. <laughs> okay, can I, I can still hear it. But now if I plug up all my senses, wow, did it go away and then suddenly come back? No. And the reason is God was still watching it. Even if you guys weren't here to watch it, you were watching it, but yes. God was watching it over time. Well, later idealists like Kant, as we'll see, alter this formula somewhat. For them, to be is to be perceivable. But now I want to move on and talk about David Hume's version of this a little bit more, because he does change our notion of object by saying that in the end, we are the ones who are actually doing all the bundling. We have to apply the same reasoning that we've just applied to external objects like tables and tulips to ourselves. Okay, what is the source of my idea of myself? If all I've got with respect to the table is not an awareness of the substance of the table, but merely a bundle of qualities that I am holding together, what about my perception of myself? Descartes says, I have this introspective awareness of myself. I am, I think. Hume says, well, wait a minute. I look inside myself and all I see are assorted thoughts, feelings, perceptions. I don't find myself an experience. And he concludes that all identity through change, including our own identity, is imposed by us. It's not there in the world. So he advances not only a bundle theory of objects, but a bundle theory of the self. He says, I may venture to affirm with the rest of, of the rest of mankind that they're nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions, which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in perpetual flux and movement. So, 
someone comes up and introduces themselves and says, I'm Dan Bonavac, who are you? You say, I am a bundle or collection of different perceptions. <laughs> That's all I am. Okay, when I intimately enter into the part uh, to what I call myself, he says, I always stumble on some particular perception of other, or rather, of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. <laughs> I can never catch myself at any time without a perception and can never observe anything but the perception. So right now, think what's going on in your mind. You're aware of what you're perceiving, right? You're aware of maybe parts of your body that you can see, but are you aware of yourself? No, you're just aware of stuff. He says, so actually we don't have any idea of ourselves, uh, of self after the manner here explained. What, from what impression could it be derived? I don't have any impression of myself, of that me that is that thing that thinks, according to Descartes. So he's thinking, look, ideas have to come from impressions. Where's my impression of myself? Even if I reflect as Descartes does and say, and I say, I am, I think, what's the I? I'm just aware of thinking, I think, of thinking, I am. I'm not actually aware of the me. So he says, here's the disturbing part. When I turn inside myself, I just see a constant flux, a constant movement. Do I see anything constant? You know, if you had, turn on a TV channel and you'll find on the bottom, you know, the little logo that tells you what channel you're watching, Fox News or CNN or whatever it happens to be, well, you, you might think, aha, I'm looking for something like that in my own mental representation, where on the side is like, Dan Bonavac, right? The world brought to you by Dan Bonavac. I don't find that. It's nowhere there, right? I got no logo. <laughs> There's nothing there that's constant throughout my perceptions. He says, I just have success, successive perceptions. There's nothing invariant, nothing constant, constitutes the mind, except that flux of impressions. So I've just got successive perceptions only that constitute the mind. So the identity which we ascribe to the mind of man, he concludes, is only a fictitious one. There is no real you. There's just a bunch of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions that you lump together and call yourself. But what is it that holds them together? <laughs> Locke would have to say something, I know not what. And Hume says, let's get rid of it. Barclay's right. Don't worry about that. Your identity is just this bundle. So the self is to be compared with perhaps the idea of a commonwealth. You say, yeah, I know there's this place and this, these people, but like, what is Austin real? I mean, I don't mean the people of Austin. I don't mean the place. I don't mean the buildings, I just mean like, Austin. Okay? <laughs> well, there's no such thing, right? It's just all those things put together. And that's the same thing true of our minds. So, the self isn't a unified thing at all. And it implies that questions about identity are really questions about language. They're not questions about the world. Well, the thing is, that's true of all objects, not just the self. It's true of everything. It's true of tulips, it's true of tables, it's true of rivers, as Heraclitus showed, you can't step into the same river twice. And also it's true of, for example, the ship of Theseus. This is a wonderful example. I won't go through the actual quotation from Plutarch, but here's the thought. Theseus is sailing around on his ship. And at certain points over the years, various planks become rotten, and they get replaced by new planks. This happens over time, and so eventually every single plank on the ship has been replaced by a new one. Now imagine that someone else has been coming along behind him, Hobbes adds this wrinkle, and gathers up all the old things, and takes them and rebuilds them in a museum, according to the original plan for the ship. And they label it the Ship of Theseus. <laughs> now Theseus is rather upset. He's still sailing around on what he calls the Ship of Theseus. And so he says, wait a minute, this is the Ship of Theseus, not that reconstructed model in the museum. But they say, look, it's the original place. In the original plan, this is the ship of Theseus. Who's right? Well, Hume says, in the end, there is no right answer. And I would close by mentioning that this is really a real world situation. That was the Camaro of Bonabac. <laughs> that was the car of Dan, OK? Eventually, it was totally worn out. After 17 years of driving that, some of which I lived over a chemical factory, which did it some harm. I was sadly sitting there waiting for it to be towed away. And somebody came around and said, why are you getting rid of that car? I said, well, look, the body is entirely rotten. It's held together with aluminum foil and roof tar. 
And they said, well, but you can get a new body. And I said, yeah, but the engine keeps breaking down and nobody can fix it. Nobody knows what's wrong. Well, you can get a new engine. Uh, yeah, but the frame is all rusted up. Well, you could get a new frame. Uh, in the end, we're talking about replacing every single thing in the car, right? And so I had to say, well, that's just a different car. That's not the same car. Um, and if I want a new car, I'll just buy a new car. In any event, the identity, whether it would be the same car or not, Hume is saying that's something we decide. It's not a factor. 